morning, everyone, and welcome to the Photographers' Gallery uh, for Post-Capitalist Photography Now, a one-day symposium, which um, is an attempt to sort of explore the parallels between photography's integration into the field of contemporary art and into the field of online platforms. And these are kinds of spaces that are both celebrated for the freedom they provide, but also provide an important means through which photography is harnessed to serve the interests of neoliberalism. So we've got a jam-packed schedule today, and, uh, but my job is to, first of all, welcome you um, on behalf of myself and Joseph over here, who's the curator of public programs. Um, my name's Katrina Lewis, and I'm the senior curator of digital programming at the Photographers' Gallery, and I also um, am a co-director of the Centre for the Study of the Networked Image at London South Bank University. And today is brought to you uh, and funded generously by London South Bank University and the University of Sussex, um, and Ben Burbridge, who is the co-director of that institution, will be saying a few words after me. Um, and I guess I just wanted to flag that this is part of a series of events uh, as our, part of our new season um, exploring um, photography and the politics of production. And uh, that's very much in dialogue with a show upstairs called All I Know Is What's On The Internet. And at 5 p.m. we'll be having a drinks reception down here and your ticket, of course, gives you access to that show. And I think um, today's event really came out of a sense that, uh, that Ben and I had and a frustration that many of the most acute and pressing questions <coughs> about um, photography today were being um, ignored in the kinds of spaces and places from the photographic community um, and ph photography theory in particular. And we found ourselves really drawing on um, the work of a number of different scholars looking at things like uh, cognitive capitalism, communicative capitalism, image capitalism, the work of people like Pasquinelli, Terranova, Jody Dean, Trevor Scholz, Christian Fuchs and others who really um, are able to sort of talk about the intertwining of labour, leisure consumption and production and play that characterises this moment and how, and I think photography is a really important uh, lens through which we might glimpse the way in which um, these uh, processes are brought to bear on us as workers um, and also a, a real sense for us as people moving between the cultural sector and education of the kind of power of the new managerialism and how that's being brought to bear not just in the kind of metrics and KPIs that are associated with um, our daily lives, but also in wider photographic culture. So we'll be hearing some speakers talking about that today. Um, so uh, I also uh, wanted to flag that there are two other, actually three other events in this series. Firstly, um, on the 30th of uh, January, you're welcome to come back uh, to Regent Street Cinema to see Andrew Norman Wilson's new film, Kodak looking at the life of his father, who was a worker at the Kodak factory, and the changes in image production. He'll be also showing his piece, um, Google Workers Leaving the Googleplex, which many of you might know. And another uh, seminar uh, or panel discussion in February, the Instabot Industrial Complex, where we'll be looking at the like economy, fake followers, CGI influencers, and the way in which cultural value uh, accumulates on those sorts of platforms. Um, so I'd like to hand over now to Ben Burbridge um, to also uh, say hello and welcome you. Thanks, Katrina. Hello. Um, I'm genuinely, it's one of those ones I'm genuinely excited about today. Um, so I'm not going to talk much because I mainly want to listen. Um, so just, just to build a little bit on, on, on Katrina's excellent introduction, um, with an anecdote, really, I learned um, a couple of weeks ago that... Uh, one of the most popular search terms on commercial stock photography websites last year was the future. Um, <laughs> which <laughs> so, and in, in, you know, as, as so often seems to be happening at the moment, the kind of operations of, of the economy kind of allegorise themselves. You kind of think, I might as well give up trying to write about this stuff. Um, and, and I think that kind of sums up two of our main concerns today uh, insofar as the very existence of, of that information points to the way photography is being operationalised. 
right? Um, and so drawing here on, on Harun Faruqi's idea of the operational image, so that's an image that is um, not just a representation of something, not just a depiction of something, but is actually part of an operation. So, so in this case, um, search activity that, that's, that's being surveyed and, and harvested and used to predict future trends and determine um, future workloads for uh, photographers working in Getty's gig economy. Um, so, so I think we're interested in ways of, of thinking of photography as, as not just an image. Um, and then secondly, uh, I think there's, you know, for, 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 for a while it was like the future had become kind of unthinkable, right? Um, this, this, this was the received wisdom, was that we were stuck at the end of history uh, in the kind of perpetual present of, of late capitalism. And, and it seems that something's shifting or has shifted, if, at least if you um, base this on the kind of number of books um, that, that are kind of dreaming up, uh, you know, kind of quasi-utopian futures, utopian futures, um, alternatives to the present. Um, and so, I mean, this term post-capitalism is a vexed one, it's ambiguous, it can mean a number of things, and I think that's one of the things we'll unpack to, to a certain extent today. Is it about identifying actually existing alternatives within the present? Or is it about larger scale structural change uh, with a kind of more overtly utopian bent? Um, and then, of course, those two things come together, right? So the operationalization of photography and, and this desire to imagine the future in some other way, insofar as we can see <laughs> that that desire is already being uh, co-opted by, by advertisers and a commercial spectacle um, at the same time as, as it's being harvested uh, to... to um, to predict future stock image trends. And so thinking through how, I mean, this is really kind of Nina's promising uh, sounding uh, suggestion that, that it's necessary to try and work out which images come from within capitalism and, and which images of the future come from somewhere else. And there's the neat segue. Um, <laughs> okay, so are you? Are you okay. Um, <laughs> So I look really unbe- So Andrew Disney, who we hope is going to join us later, everyone's got sick. That like everyone involved with the, the organisation of this event is ill to varying degrees. <laughs> my, I'm, yeah, I'm from Brighton. My, I'm normally nasal, but not quite like this. Um, so I look unprepared. But that was then. Okay. So Nina Power uh, teaches philosophy at the University of Roehampton and is the author of many articles on philosophy politics and culture. She'll be delivering the keynote today uh, called Imi- uh, Imagining Decapitalism After the Image. So could you welcome Nina. Right, thanks Ben. Um, <laughs> I, shall I get a man to bring up my thing for me? Um, no, I can do it. Feminism for you. Um, Right. Why can't I see it though? Okay. Okay. Um, I have quite a bad uh, PowerPoint, of course, but I'm not an image person. I just talk about images. I don't, you know, know how to use them. Um, okay. So my talk is called "Imagining Decapitalism After the Image," and I wanted to add in a second part of that. Uh, which is and enemy photography, which is the concept I'm going to talk about at the beginning, and I'm going to talk about decapitalism at the end. Um, so, in a sense, it's quite a broad and speculative uh, talk um, that tries to think conceptually um, about the image in relation to capitalism and particular strategies of thinking both capitalism um, and the image <laughs> together. Um, So I want to think about ideas, like I say, of enemy photography, which I'll explain uh, in a bit, Um, ideas of counter-images, to think about the image itself as the enemy um, and ask what kind of counter-images might be. Um, And of course I'm talking about the image in a more abstract sense, um, and I don't uh, there is some reference to photography as a sort of discipline, as an empirical set of uh, things, production and so on, um, you know, a, a discursive object if you like, but I think it's also broader than that, though I'll, I'll kind of slide between the image and the photograph. 
um, to some extent, probably slightly irritating way. Um, I think one of the, the tasks before us lies in untangling what particular images of the world mean. And of course, we live in the, the age of the world picture, the way in which we think about the world structures how we think and feel. We can ask which images of capital come from capital itself and which form alternatives to it. Are there any uh, images um, that would work as alternatives? <laughs> Which abstractions damage us and which offer us images of hope? What should we be mapping and how should we be acting? <clears throat> Where do our enemies lie? In front of us or hidden? And I think it's this question, um, someone like Baudrillard will talk a lot about transparency. Uh, this is a very, very complicated question about how we map things like uh, abstraction. How do we kind of... Uh, imagine capital in ways that don't just kind of repeat its own myth or story about itself, and we are talking about <coughs> myths. When we talk about the future, what are we saying we believe in? Dare we talk about the future when so much of the present lies in ruins around us? Um, I want to then begin, this is something I've been thinking about m very recently, is this idea of enemy, uh, enemy photography, and I'm taking this idea um, from the, from an earlier concept of enemy painting, which is an idea uh, by Joseph Leo Kerner in his excellent study of Bosch and Bruegel, um, entitled From Enemy Painting to Everyday Life, and he compares the two um, painters. So what does he mean by enemy painting? Um, and what do I mean by enemy photography? I don't mean the enemy image as we might normally understand that phrase, which is to say a kind of propaganda against a particular group as a tactic of war, perhaps, the, sort of the image of the enemy as such, but something more fundamental, perhaps, at the level of the image uh, itself, and not just images, too. I think there are other um, a sort of attempts to kind of map what I'm talking about. So, for example, in Chino Amobi's record, Paradiso, from 2017, where he kind of makes this uh, absolutely epic uh, sort of cinematic uh, sound work, which kind of attempts to uh, sort of um, represent the kind of current state of things based on um, his uh, understanding of, of paradise and hell. It's a very interesting record. Um, but to go back to, to Kerner's idea, this kind of art historical idea, Kerner argues that Bosch depicts um, a metaphysical uh, struggle um, through the medium of painted images against primarily Satan. Bosch's paintings originally served a ritual purpose, he says, to teach a lesson uh, that the world is sinful, an enemy territory that should be held in contempt. Bosch shows humanity enthralled by the world, but at the same time on the brink of judgment and damnation. Okay, so far we might recognise this kind of idea. So everyday life and Satan go hand in hand. Bosch, of course, was accused of being in league with the devil himself uh, in his work, um, because of his work. Um, and we are kind of confronted in the background, although I can't go into detail, but I think Emily might be talking about um, iconoclasm um, and idolatry later on, perhaps. Sorry, Emily, if you're not, but <laughs> I thought you might be. Um, huh? Displace your responsibility. Exactly. Now I've just given her another task. But in a sense, you know, this kind of question about what can and can't be depicted, which is not merely and, and shouldn't be, be understood primarily as only a religious question. I mean, I think historically we tend to think of these questions as, as dominated by a kind of religious uh, aspect, a religious relation to images. Um, but I think we can very well talk about iconoclasm um, and idolatry today as well, of course. It's not, not simply and shouldn't be reduced uh, to this you know, religious history, not, not at all. Kerner um, argues that Bosch painted on the eve of Protestant iconoclasm when images would be physically punished and destroyed as if human enemies. He therefore played a potentially dangerous game. So what is Bosch doing in these kinds of images? In certain works, Kerner argues, the enemy is contained within... Uh, forces presented are human and diabolical as part of the larger spectacle. In one work in particular, this one, Kerner argues Bosch fabricates something unique, what he calls an enemy painting, as if his brush were an instrument of enmity, he says. Bosch knew exactly what he was doing, Kerner argues. In the Garden of Earthly Delights, uh, this painting is posed, Kerner says, playfully and cruelly, as if it were meant to ruin someone, perhaps especially its beholder. 
Okay, so in that sense, the painting itself, and perhaps, and of course, you have to read it triptychly, um, is perhaps designed as a kind of antagonistic image or a series of, of increasingly uh, sort of provocative um, and potentially upsetting uh, images designed to kind of strike uh, uh, you in a particular kind of way or, or designed to strike perhaps um, particular viewers of the image uh, in, a, in a certain kind of way. And of course we can think about this in relation to later concepts like Brecht's alienation effect or something like this and maybe um, talk about modernist, more modernist ideas of, of how to uh, create a certain kind of effect um, in, in the audience or viewer. Um, but I want to maybe return or keep open uh, the idea of a certain sacred, notion of the sacred. Um, <coughs> and what it might mean to talk about the sacred in a, what is, you know, widely understood to be a very profane world, and particularly in relation to images, the profanation of images. The image is always sacred, Jean-Luc Nancy says. The sacred remains that which is set apart and forms no bond. It is distinct, Nancy says. And I think of this more as a kind of challenge and a provocation rather than a kind of, I don't know, a claim, a, a sort of factual claim, if you see what I mean. What would it mean to sort of resurrect the sacred? And of course we can think about projects like Bataille's and the College of Sociology, that kind of attempt at the early, in the early 20th century to try to sort of reopen uh, the possibility uh, of the sacred. Bosch's work resembles the sacred, Kerner says. And of course, thus plays with risk and potential misunderstanding, as well as with uh, taboos around the, the image and what can and can't be shown. Um, this question of enemy photography, we can ask, what might it mean today? What might it be today to construct enemy images, right? To, to take photographs that are themselves enemy photographs. What metaphysical struggles and sacred questions might photography in particular, and the image more generally, be able to pose. We might think of Carl Schmitt's distinction of the friend and the enemy, which he claims is fundamental uh, to all politics. Um, is this question also fundamental to all images? Um, we can think about left Schmittians as well as Schmitt himself being a right-wing thinker. But where are our enemies today? How can we um, represent them what tools of representation can we use when these tools themselves are also being used against us constantly? Um, ben, in the introduction, talked about a kind of uh, end of history idea. Uh, Baudrillard, in 2001, talks about this. Um, he says, the universal was an idea. When it realized itself in the global, it commits suicide as idea, an ideal end. Having become the sole reference and a humanity imminent in itself, having occupied the empty place of the dead God, the human now reigns alone, but it no longer has any ultimate rationale. No longer having any enemy, it generates one from within and secretes all kinds of inhuman metastases. So has something shifted? Are we able to talk instead of a kind of post-capitalist uh, period? I'm skeptical of the idea of uh, post-capitalism, as I'll, I'll, I'll describe uh, later. Um, and I want to maybe ask, in relation to this Baudrillard quote, that whether, whether we're living in the era of this inhuman metastasis of the image, perhaps. Um, all kinds of inhuman metastases, Baudrillard says. Very unpleasant idea. What role is left for the artist when we are all around, surrounded by what appear to be enemy images of different kinds, the images capitalism has of itself, the images capitalism produces, the images people produce of and for capitalism, the images of people uh, produced for and by capitalism, and we can also think about uh, I did the relationship between capitalism and authoritarianism in the use of image capture, um, whether it's with an authoritarian, you know, more classically authoritarian uh, sheen or with a smiling face emoji. Um, these are images that you probably will guess are taken from uh, the rich kids of Instagram type uh, element of the internet. Um, these are images that we might on some level describe of... Um, the images people produce of and for capitalism in a certain way, they're obviously um, quite 
uh, obscene and they're sort of supposed to be um, obscene in a particular way. Um, I like this one, about to, about to buy some peasants. Um, we can also think about the way in which these sort of topics have also been uh, depicted in the work of someone like Martin Parr and his work on luxury and so on. I don't want to talk too much about specific <coughs> photographers, but really to sort of more obliquely um, open up this question, basically. You know, it, it can't simply be uh, images of, of wealth and consumption, although that's clearly uh, part of what we're talking about. I'm also talking about the images capitalism has of itself, Right? So this idea of capitalism as this kind of, this idea of a kind of uh, infinitely connected, exciting, electronic kind of shooting all over the world uh, type of thing. But to go back to the authoritarianism point, we can also think about the use in, in China, for example, by all, by all accounts, New York Times this year, with millions of cameras and billions of lines of code, China is building a high-tech authoritarian future Beijing is embracing technologies like facial recognition and artificial intelligence to identify and track 1.4 billion people. It wants to assemble a vast and unprecedented national surveillance system with crucial help from its thriving technology industry. Okay, so at one end, this use of kind of capture, the capture of the face. Um, we can ask, is it however easier sometimes to get people to do it to themselves? Um, what are we also doing every time we kind of capture our face, or the face of another, whether it's with a soft hand or with a firm hand, whether we're holding the camera or something else is holding the camera. Um, I wanted to quote Marshall McLuhan in conversation with Norman Mailer from 1968 on this question of the, the artist, the possible role of the artist in relation to enmity. Um, McLuhan says this, Every age creates as a utopian image a nostalgic rearview mirror image of itself which puts it thoroughly out of touch with the present. The present is the enemy. The present is only faced in any generation by the artist. The artist is prepared to study the present as his material because it is the area of challenge to the whole sensory life. And I'm going to come back to this idea of the whole sensory life. And therefore, it's anti-utopian. It's a world of anti-values. And the artist who comes into contact with the present produces an avant-garde image that is terrifying to contemporaries. Okay, and it's that question of whether this is uh, possible um, in an era kind of dominated by horrific uh, images uh, that are not produced perhaps with this, with this avant-garde purpose in mind. We need to ask, what is the present? How do we conceptualise uh, the present? Recent proposals have called for a strong constructive attempt to bring about certain futures. And here is a kind of post-capitalist idea. And I think we need to, be, to get clear in our minds what the relationship between projects like anti-capitalist uh, thinking was about. I mean, maybe we associate this with a certain kind of um, you know, earlier type of protest, and perhaps in the 90s, the Battle of Seattle, direct street confrontation to some extent, uh, an image of uh, a different kind of uh, a world, one in which is uh, pro-environmental, um, anti-violence, and so on. Uh, strategies of anti-capitalism would include holding up mirrors, sometimes literally in protests, um, to reflect back the image of power. And this is a kind of very interesting tactic that's often used um, in that sense. And that in, in that way, there is an image of capital or like the violence of capital that is, is um, imagined as violence, as force, as police officers, let's say, in that kind of confrontation. Um, Anti-capitalism is also a lot more than that. And, but I think it's interesting that we've moved perhaps to thinking about post-capitalism instead as the primary strategic uh, conceptual um, term, you know, what is the relation then between anti and post capitalism? Post capitalism might also be an anti capitalism, um, but there are kinds of post capitalisms that are also accepting of capitalism as well, in a certain sense. It's, it's a kind of contested term. I have elsewhere tried to think about the idea of decapitalism, which I'll maybe briefly mention at the end again, which is to say, what would it mean to kind of um, sort of uh, recognize the ruling class in a certain sense, to be able to depict who our enemies are. And this is the question 
suppose I'm asking. And we know very well how, how people like to hide, <laughs> how people with power like to hide not only the, their wealth, but also themselves. So we have a kind of situation of hyper-visualisation and capture for the majority, and a kind of, uh, or, or a kind of anonymous death um, as well. Um, at, but at the same time, a kind of hiddenness of perhaps um, what is really going on. And this is a kind of question of the occult to a certain extent and the visualisation, what we can and can't see. Um, so, but thinking about post-capitalism, because that's the, the term for today in a certain way, um, on the left you have the idea that automation will replace kind of horrible work in a certain sense, that we can get machines to, to do things for us. I think this is... Uh, um, possibly naive in some ways. There are there are lots of work lots of work that we cannot automate. Mostly care work, the kind of work that has historically been racialized and gendered in very specific ways, has been unpaid or underpaid. We might collectively ask ourselves whether we would like robots to look after uh, babies and the sick and the elderly. Um, at the moment, I think we would say no. Although I think that question is coming up uh, globally. Uh, Care robots for elderly people in Japan tend to have the effect of making them more lonely. Who could have predicted that? Um, <laughs> automation in its current formulation also depends very much on the use of fossil fuels, which doesn't in any sense uh, have a particularly uh, prolonged and sustainable idea of what that would mean. Now, obviously, we can't even really recycle batteries, for goodness sake. Anyway, automation ends up being uh, a sort of, uh, sort of techno-fetishism in many ways. Okay, of course, we are already automated. We live in the era of the algorithm and, and so on. But there are kind of moral and ethical and social political questions that we can ask ourselves. Nevertheless, let's, let's go with the kind of the, the positive post-capitalist idea. So... Automation will replace horrible work. Universal basic income will ensure that no one, or at least those in particular countries, will be absolutely poor. And platforms from online to governmental will be taken over by those with a sustainable plan for the future against those who seek to exhaust the earth and enslave humanity in the name of uh, profit for a, a small few. Post-capitalist thinkers like Paul Mason attempt to describe, um, and Nick Senechek and Alex Williams and, and others on the sort of left accelerationist uh, end, attempt to describe new political subjects following the death of older images of the proletariat above all else. And this is a quote um, from Paul Mason. By creating millions of networked people, financially exploited, but with the whole of human intelligence one thumbswipe away, Info-capitalism has created a new agent of change in history, the educated and connected human being, says Paul Mason. So these educated and connected beings lie at one end of the production chain, a kind of canny consumer, if you like. This is uh, the agency granted to this end uh, person. But how and is this connected human being immune from hidden uh, or cult-like thinking? Um, I don't think... It is, in any way. How can it be? Um, Franco Bifo Baradi identifies three aspects instead of what he calls in his depressive mode, he kind of oscillates between a depressive and optimistic mode, um, of what he calls the looming war. Okay. He says, the first front is the neoliberal power that is tightening its grip of governance, pursuing the agenda of austerity and privatisation. The second front is the anti-global Trumpism based on white resentment and working class despair. The third front, taking place largely backstage, is the growing necro-empire of terrorism in all its different shapes of religious bigotry, national rage and economic strategy that I identify as necro-capital. Okay, and here is the question about this uh, identification of necro-capital and how we might represent or think through necro-capital um, without itself becoming one of its images uh, in a certain way. Included in this diagnosis, then, is a mixture of governmental power, economic strategy, <coughs> racial politics, religious impulses, and violence. We are perhaps familiar with this war that Bifo describes, and we can point to images, forces, and activism that directly seeks to oppose this war with, let's say, a militant kind of peace, a call for a return to social democratic politics, the renationalisation re of public services, government funding of education, anti-racist politics, and the second civil rights <coughs> movement in the form of Black Lives Matter protests in the US, UK, 
and else, elsewhere, an endless call for tolerance in the face of nationalist and religious violence and so on. But where, what and where exactly is necro-capital? Um, BFO elsewhere describes it in the following way. Neoliberal deregulation has opened the way to a regime of worldwide necro-economy. The all-encompassing law of competition has cancelled out moral prescription and legal regulations. Since its earliest phase, phases, Thatcher's neoliberal philosophy prescribed war among individuals. Hobbes, Darwin and Hayek have all been summoned to conceptualise the end of social civilization, the end of peace. Forget about the religious or ideological labels of the agents of massive violence and look at their true nature. Take the Sinaloa cartel and Daesh and compare them to Blackwater and ExxonMobil. They have much more in common than, may, than you may think. Their common goal is to extract the maximum amount of money from their investments in the most exciting products of the contemporary economy, terror, horror, and death. Necrocapitalism is the emerging economic order of the world, right? So that's BFO's uh, idea. So neoliberalism then, according to this idea, has based itself on the resurrection of the Hobbesian war of all against all. And this, in turn, has given way to a necro-neoliberalism that seeks to profit off of excitement in terror, horror, and death. There is no doubt that war, drugs, sex, trafficking in bodies, and terrorism can be extremely profitable <coughs> for some people. The individual and collective corpses generated by these trades are sometimes circulated as image, images. If they are deemed both palatable and shocking enough, think of the image of Alan Kurdi, the Syrian Kurdish boy, whose drowned corpse is rendered horribly iconic by international media, but the, these images do not seem to generate a political depth, but merely a kind of brief, dismayed, sentimental response. Necrocapitalism is also the profiting off of the images of the dead. And we can talk about necrocapitalism as a kind of visual field, as well as an economic uh, tendency. We might also pause here for a moment and ask a question that crosses economics and aesthetics. Why exactly are terror, horror, and death exciting? Why are there markets in these emotions and states of being? Maybe this is a kind of you know, political anthropological question. How do fictional and real images of violence contribute to the idea made mat material that these primal fears and forces are in any way something desirable? And if they have become desirable, how might we get out of them? And this is a kind of problem of, of counter images and counter feelings, uh, counter sentiments, uh, perhaps. When things have become so blunt, how do you kind of make things subtle uh, again? Um, Achille Mbembe's work on necropolitics has been extremely important for thinking about the real relationships at the heart of politics in this regard. He writes, instead of considering reason as the truth of the subject, we can look to other foundational categories that are less abstract and more tactile, such as life and death. Mbembe, through his reading of Hegel, Bataille and Foucault, that centers on the relationship between politics, violence and death, points out um, in particular, the central role of slavery in any worthwhile conception of history. The humanity of the slave appears as the perfect figure of a shadow. Indeed, the slave condition results from a triple loss. Loss of a home, loss of rights over his or her body, and loss of political status. This triple loss is identical with absolute domination, natal alienation, and social death, expulsion from humanity altogether. And this touches on the question of what is and isn't represented. Um, I would say. The slave, Mbembe states, is kept alive but in a permanent state of in injury. Slave life, Mbembe claims, then, is a form of death in life. By combining BFO and, and Mbembe's analyses, we can say that necrocapitalism is not simply the profiting from violence and terror, but is predicated on differentiated racialized and sexualized violence and terror. And the entire history of humanity must be seen in this light if we are to understand how death and life are central to both aesthetics and ec economics today, no matter how much both pretend to beauty or norma normality or to this image of capitalism itself as this uh, gleaming, sort of humanless uh, image. So I'm interested in ways of thinking, this is the, uh, the great uh, sort of floating rubbish island, it's in the ocean. 
Um, I'm interested in ways of thinking uh, about an anti-necrocapitalism that in the first place takes seriously the subjects and the suffering constructed by this kind of economy. I'm interested in aesthetics at the same time that recognises the power of violent images and refuses to accept that all images are equal. Okay, and that, it, this is, in a sense, one of the major claims I want to, to make. We might be cynical, open to anything and everything, um, and be worried about censorship, you know, we can't kind of uh, prohibit images in that sense. We are kind of anti-iconoclastic um, in a certain way. We, we might feel personally that we, we are able to keep our safe search off. We, we might pride ourselves on our ability to watch graphic violence, to take the most violent scenes of murder, rape and torture, uh, and sex for that matter. But if we lose the ability to differentiate between real violence and fictionalised violence, um, because we've watched too many films and played too many games, then we are, I think, easy prey for a certain kind of necrocapitalism. It is difficult to make this argument, though, without appearing to, to be taking a moralistic or a censorious or even a religious uh, approach. And I think, again, to revisit that question of um, the religious relation to images, which is an extremely large and difficult topic. Yet we should remember that we already live online in a world in which we are a priori, preemptively protected from certain images by people paid very little to work as content moderation workers for Facebook, for example, largely based in the Philippines. There's some interesting investigative uh, work on this. And these people are paid um, to see all of the pornography, gore, minors, sexual solicitation, sexual body parts, images and racism, uh, and decapitation in particular, which is important for my argument, and remove these images and texts before others might see them. Okay, so they're kind of human filters, if you like, um, for all of the things that we, we don't see in order to watch cat videos and look at baby pictures, yeah? So these are the images behind all of those uh, nice images. The psychological toll of this work is extreme and many of these workers quickly experience burnout. We may seek out images that horrify and terrorise us, but many workers don't have this choice um, and many people don't have the choice to see these things in real life um, either. What do images do to us? There is no doubt that Western art, thought and subjectivity is a scopophilic exercise. In principle, no images are off limits or forbidden to us. And we take great pleasure in images above, perhaps, <coughs> touch, sound and smell, particularly uh, today. We are saturated in images and any edict against the icon has been soundly eliminated. To destroy images in the name of a religious or moral belief is now, in any case, seemingly impossible, as the replication and proliferation of every image has meant that, even if we destroy the original, though all the copies will be left. With the advent of photography and digital images, we even less remember what it is like to venerate an original or to elevate or sacralize some images above others, or to even uh, refuse the image, I would say. We try to capture life on a daily basis, pinning down movement like a butterfly collector would his fluttering prey. But this sketch seems too quick. Scopophilia is not merely a condemnation or a recognition. It also describes an atmosphere and an act or a series of acts involving pleasure. Why might we dwell over a particular image, luxuriate in its meaning and feeling? The everyday production of billions of images with a phone camera may have a whole host of dimensions, from status signaling to anxiety reduction or anxiety increase, from generalised narcissism to a celebration of the body, but it also indicates a strong will to pleasure in the image as such, as an entire culture. The democratisation of the image brought about by the widespread possession of pocket cameras has opened up certain possibilities, we also have to say. As writer Aria Dean puts it of the period, around 2013, the selfie soon was written of as a sign of life, as the ultimate tactic towards visibility. As we were taught by the likes of Susan Sontag, photographs furnish evidence. The image is, or can be, a powerful verifying tool, and with the selfie it seemed that you could continually verify and affirm your very existence on your own terms. The contemporary feminist reclamation of the image of the female form in particular, motivated understandably by the idea that the male gaze can be disrupted by seizing control of the means of visual representation, still suffers, Dean argues, from the reassertion of, amongst other things, 
whiteness, classical prettiness, and other core markers of status. In other words, the, the selfie, the reclamation of uh, one's own image did nothing really to undermine a particular visual hierarchy. Perhaps it could do nothing else. What were we expecting? Dean then asks very interestingly, and this essay is called Closing the Loop. It's online. It's a very good essay, I think, particularly uh, think about the politics of photography. Um, she then asks whether a politics of anti-representation or, or a refusal of the image might not then be preferable than intervention into these endless circuits of repetitious images. In this sense, this would be the tempting option, perhaps, to refuse the image, to refuse participation, however this might be possible. And obviously, in some sense, uh, when there are CCTV cameras everywhere, it's not possible. To, you, one cannot live, as it were, off-grid in the imagistic sense, um, we might say. Dean ultimately, in any, in any case, refuses this, this option of anti-representation, though she entertains it, I think, in a very profound way. But are we then the product of the images we see? What might this mean if images themselves are already locked into a dialectic with forms of structural <coughs> occlusion that we cannot immediately see from the images that do end up before us? We do not always take seriously the power of the image to disrupt the way we conceive of ourselves, either as individuals or as members of a group. When we talk about representation, we are dealing with a strange double or even triple echo Representation stand in or simply stand for other things, whether aesthetically, symbolically, mentally, linguistically. A painting of fruit represents fruit, but it also symbolises fruit and may carry with it a whole host of other meanings, decadence, death, the court of a king, marriage, and so on. But representation is also and always a political question, and this was, of course, like a feminist, second wave feminist point amongst others. Um, who gets to represent others? be it the people or particular groups of people. There is perhaps a third way, then, we can think about representation that is also a little more ambiguous, how the mind itself mentalises, how we present anything to ourselves at all, like the structures of uh, representation as such. Some of these types of representations are within our control. Some might even form some kind of duty, and others seem unchosen by us. Who or what decides the scope of our field of vision? How do images in turn shape what our representations then become? Just as photography or the, the arrival of photography changed how human memory works, you know, and this is a really important point, I mean, the way in which technology intervenes in this kind of deep ontological sense in our conception of ourselves. You know, when people talk about their memories now, they often talk as if memories are photographs or like photographs, as well as using photographs as kind of markers of memory. So memory itself it shifts uh, with the invention of uh, photography. All these things affect us so profoundly. Um, so just as photography did this to memory, so images more broadly appear to do something to the way in which we see images in the first place, but this remains obscure. This is a kind of meta question about representation. How do we uh, imagize, let's say, to use a horrible word, or we can say imagine, if you like. Um, the gallery or the museum, then, is always a place where nothing is straightforward and everything can and often does go wrong, where sensibilities are offended symbolically and directly, where questions of time and space are raised in their most abstract and yet most concrete form. It is a place outside of the everyday, to go back to this question of the profane and the particular possibility uh, of the avant-garde, as McLuhan puts it, but of art uh, more generally, um, and yet it is a kind of dark mirror to this, this very outside that it seeks to reflect. Images are not just about things or ideas, but always about representation and its opposite, iconoclasm. What is seen and what is not seen. Images are much more serious than our current system and culture would indicate, we would say. We are flooded with images, but we cannot cope with what they might mean. To take each image seriously uh, would be kind of uh, devastating, we might say. So we turn to a kind of protective attitude of blasé indifference, kind of visual nihilism. But images are, of course, in touch with our deepest possibilities and most complicated feelings. As Chris Davis says, what is the power of representation? Does the image succumb to the violence of death, or does it possess the gift of modulating it? Just as images reveal, often by not showing, the way in which the entire visual economy is shaped by voids, gaps, and holes, who is seen and who is not, as well as how they are seen, as abject, object, or agent, 
Images contain within them a curious kind of power, a matter of life and death, as Jonathan Bella puts it. And Bella's work, I think, is some of the, the most interesting, uh, particularly on the question of uh, race and capital and the invention of uh, photography uh, in, on this question. All the possible violence of death, as Chris Daver imagines it. Can images, by playing with those most fundamental fears and possibilities, restore us to a new understanding of both life and death, one that isn't already kind of captured um, by capitalism, that doesn't generate only a kind of uh, captured thought or captured feeling? Has there been a visual shift whereby the religious paintings, in inverted commas, and images of previous centuries have now been historically surpassed by newer, more oblique reflections on the same questions? I'm nearly finished. If images are capable of modulating death, I know it's very cheery for a Saturday morning. So, um, <laughs> images are capable of modulating death, um, then we are surely dealing with something potentially very profound, indeed, and does not, which does not, of course, mean um, that we cannot approach the question with a certain lightness. And yet today, so much of this question of representation is passed over as blasé, banal, archaic. In one sense, though, it is an archaic question in the sense of being a very old problem. Representation then became one of the central questions of feminism too, because it was fem feminism that precisely tackled this question at the level of the aesthetic and the political at the same time. Chris Deva articulates the question of the visual in relation to death and the decapitation or the elimination of the possibility of the visual altogether. And this is why decapitation is such a kind of crucial um, phenomenon in relation to the image as such, and that this is what Kristeva argues in her book, The Severed Head, which is all about not just the representation, the depiction of decapitation, but of decapitation um, as the elimination of the possibility of the visual. So like the kind of the ending of uh, how we see, if you like, not just literally, um, but as a kind of uh, how we conceive of the visual field. After all, what is sight if there is no head? Let's put it bluntly. Um, she writes this. If the vision of our intimate thought really is the capital vision that humanity has produced of itself, doesn't it have to be constructed precisely by passing through an obsession with the head as symbol of the, th as the, th of the thinking living being, through a ritual of the skull, of beheading, of decapitation, which might be the preliminary condition for the representation of what allows us to stand up to the void that is none other than the ability to represent the life of the mind uh, or psychological experiences, the capacity for multiple representations. So before we see anything, there is the seeing itself, let's put it this way. And, and in the West, it's completely related to the, to the head, we would say. So, and remember, it's decapitation videos. Actually, decapitation videos are very blurry lines. Sometimes they allow them, sometimes they don't. They occupy this very liminal space in terms of what can and can't be seen. And of course, you can watch decapitation videos made by ISIS and others. Um, and often these have very high production values. Uh, the question of their veracity or otherwise is a very difficult question. It's not necessarily in doubt that people are killed. Um, but the way in which they're killed in the videos is not necessarily uh, straightforward, and whether they're killed in the videos or not. We must go through the head, the capital, that which can be decapitated, and then the play on the word capital and capitalism, in order to understand the ocular. The head is the condition for the possibility of sight as such. But which way do we turn our head? Are we always driven towards the macabre images of death, pointing to a fundamental tie between the image and finitude as such. The contemporary gallery goer is a cerebral, reflective being, obsessed with documenting, introspecting and observing mentally or in text and in his or her own images. Yet we are perhaps far away from understanding that this has anything to do with the preliminary condition for the representation of what allows us to stand up to the void, as Chris Daver puts it very dramatically, which seems rather a grandiose demand, perhaps. We do not generally walk around imagining ourselves as beings without heads or heads without beings, at least most of the time. We do not have any uh, rituals in contemporary Western art that remind us that decapitation, that the capacity for visual life is always capable of being removed. It is always nearer than we think. We are obsessed with heads still, but these are heads generally as bearers of thoughts, not as heads in themselves, although of course we can point to particular images of decapitation that are extremely central um, to our canonical thinking of representation and also the relationship between the sexes, um, which is very important. 
We are obsessed with them, but these are heads of bearers of thoughts, not heads in themselves, let alone always perilous objects that also serve as the precondition for thinking and being as such. Yet representation would perish without the head. The head is the transcendental precondition for the possibility of thought and vision as such. Okay, just to finish then, let's pose, I want to pose again uh, this question of enemy photography um, and contemporary art, whether it can um, live up, in a sense, to this idea of image thought, of this kind of decapitated or capitated uh, relation. Uh, we might have uh, ideas of death and life, of vision, of headedness, uh, what might an enemy photography for the 21st century uh, look like? Might it bring back um, the question of decapitation, of the head as the site of possibility of vision, and how might we relate to this, to this idea of decapitalism, of identifying and, in a sense, uh, removing <laughs> somehow uh, the head of this kind of uh, body um, that governs us and isn't always... Uh, seen. Um, when Freud says in relation to the head of the Medusa that to decapitate equals to castrate, we are in the presence of a profound truth and one that puts a feminist theory of art and photography perhaps in a primary uh, position. These are both by men, but yeah, what can you do? Uh, this is Winnie in Happy Days buried up to her neck. Um, we can also return to Dean's dialectical entertaining of the possibility of refusing representation as such in relation to the troubled history of the racism of the image, and yet we can also devise a new politics of looking and being looked at, as she puts it, not merely at the level of images of ourselves or of other human bodies, but in relation to the entire visual field. Um, so in a sense, this is a kind of plea for images that make clearer who or what the enemy is, even at the cost of inducing a certain kind of anguish uh, in the viewer, but not the kind of anguish or pain that kind of uh, inculcates um, indifference somehow or is part of this visual nihilism um, that I'm talking about, this blasé attitude because we're flooded with images and that, that sort of levelling out the horizontalization of images um, as such. What kind of enemy photography uh, might rouse us um, in a certain way to think and to feel um, again? Um, I'll leave it there. Oh, do you want me? What do you want? Me to play? I don't understand. Okay. I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, we have. We'll. we'll go into the coffee break slightly, um, and we'll make up the time later. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, what a journey <laughs> from Hieronymus Bosch, anti-capitalism, death, <laughs> beheading, content moderation, exhibition of photography. I think everyone is spinning after that, oh, um, but in a really good way. Where I wanted to open it up uh, to questions. Does anyone have any immediate questions or shall I just ask a question while you're all... Gathering it could be comments thoughts. or anything. Um, yeah. Please wait for the mic. Um, I'm, I'm wondering that you might be equating photography too closely to seeing. So, yeah, probably. Yeah, and, and that, you know, you, you, there's a kind of assumption that t to photograph is to see. And the question then is, what is it that we see when we look at a photograph, if we see at all? I mean, and I'm thinking about the images of beheading that yeah. um, Elkins has in the object stairs back, you know, where he, he makes this argument where he says that we actually cannot see death. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I think there might be a kind of form of resistance in there that is you know, can be an enemy photography. So it's, it's just, it's an observation more than a question, really. Yeah, no, 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 that's really good. Um, no, I, th I, think, I think you're right. I mean, I think I ended up talking quite a lot about the sort of, you know, transcendental conditions of the possibility of seeing as such and, you know, in relation to 
how we particularly conceive of, of death or, or life. Um, I suppose, um, yeah, I mean, th I mean, thinking about the, well, the, the sort of the history of the representational or the, the idea of like the memento mori, I suppose, you know, as a kind of part of a history of thinking about art and, and the kind of, you know, the way that plays into a particular conceptualization of like the brevity of life, the vanity of, you know, the everyday and so on. And, and it seems to me we don't quite have that world picture in the same way, you know. So what does it mean to, to remember death, let's say, in the midst of life? Um, it's, it's a slightly different question now, and I'm not quite sure I could speak uh, well enough ab about it, but I, at, at the moment, I think, I, I mean, I do agree, like, in a sense, I mean, photography, in a sense, sort of comes to take the place of memory in a certain way, so you no longer need symbolic representations of things to rem be remembered of, right? So you have personalised memories, and I think something like Blade Runner plays with this extremely well, with the use of photographs as, you know, constructing what it means to have uh, a character and a life in the replicants, you know, they have photographs, you know, as if to prove they, they have a backstory. Um, and so I think, in a sense, the entire question of memory then is, is captured by photography, perhaps in some way, another grandiose claim, why not? Um, but I think, I mean, one of the tricky things when it comes to this sort of imagining both, well, representing, capturing what capitalism is in the first place, but also of creating images that do this kind of strange work I'm trying to talk about in the, the enemy photography, the antagonism that isn't reducible to acceptance, let's say, but then also about what it might mean to, to represent or capture images of what is possible as well, like a different image of the world. And I think, you know, when we look at kind of anti-capitalist photographs, I mean, think of Alan Sekula's images of protest, for example, you know, there you do have a certain image of what anti-capitalism, you know, this is what anti-capitalism looks like, in a certain way, with all of its ambiguities and, and complexities, and the idea that you can make manifest, let's say, the opposition between state and individual, you know, through the mirroring of the police officer or whatever. And, and post, you know, imagining post-capitalism then seems much more complicated, and it does, it would indeed also be about not seeing. I mean, I, I try to say it's about what's not seen. You know, uh, there, are, there are certain forms of anonymity and grouping and, uh, you know, the masses that drown in the Mediterranean. You know, th there are ways of being, obviously, that are not capturable. They're not even part of a visual economy. You know, millions of human beings in a certain way are not part of this, what we're talking about. And but they are kind of sometimes captured in a particular way or the images are then part of this kind of necro-neoliberal imagistic economy of, of terror and death. So I, I agree that the emphasis was too weighted towards seeing. I, I mean, I basically, I just take your point in a very lengthy way. I just agreed with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? Can, can I just ask very quickly, uh, Nina? Mm. Um, would you say then the task of a photographer or a photography, photographic institution might be not to represent the world but to represent representation? Is that well? I think it does it anyway because you can't not do. I mean, this is like in a sense Chris Davis' point that mm. you know, and in a sense, of course, all rep all representation of anything are also representations of representation. You know, it. I mean, we we I think we do think both in terms of content and expression all the time. We don't just think, oh, that's a photograph of something. You know, it's also, that's a photograph. You know, that's the, the medium, you know, as, as it were. And I think, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether <laughs> there are didactic tasks in that way. I think, you know, these places hold open these questions, you know, by their very nature. Um, and we have, a, I mean, a difficult question about where things can and can't be seen and discussed, we might say, because, you know, moving from a sort of political framework in which we can discuss things like outside the factory gates and perhaps now we discuss those things inside the gallery and in a certain way the gallery is the place, you know, Peter Osborne and others make this point, you know, where you can discuss anything, but it might not mean anything, if you see what I mean. Like, we're, we're allowed to talk about... Neco-capitalism, 
but but in a sense it doesn't have a kind of uh, practical or you know consequence in that way so it may be that there's sort of too much opening going on or speculation including me I'm part of this world <laughs> you know um, and and not enough clarity and maybe it's that clarity I'm interested in you know what yeah what uh, what enemy photography might be able to do I suppose and whether, whether it makes sense to talk about enemy photography I just thought this Kerner idea was so striking you know so brilliant I suppose as a way of reading anyway <coughs> <coughs> I wonder if it's sort of part of a bigger... I mean, it is obviously part of a f bigger phenomena, isn't it? It's almost sort of identifying... It's, it's a, it's a it, it is a crashing sort of moment if the personal is political, whereby you are absolutely saying what it is. There is a, there is a requirement to be... to define things better, to grasp the enormity of the situation, to be able to say what it is, and it's, it's actually really dull. <laughs> It's a sort of, you know, it's the legwork. It's the, it's the tedious sort of research and the, uh, uh, you know, a requirement to attention to detail and to know, to do, to do the research that's necessary for you to understand better what the circumstances are, which means that you have a better grasp of the images that are being produced and your production within that field. I just think it's, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of dull, but it's, it's, it's necessary. It's kind of a moment whereby there is no more sitting on the fence. There is no more ambiguity left, you know, in this situation for us to yeah. toy with somehow. I mean, I, th I think so. I mean, also, it's, but it's also extremely difficult. I mean, when we talk about real abstractions of capital, I mean, you know, like all of the projects of mapping, you know, we've had a lot of people in recent, you know, trying to map capital, you know, through artistically, theoretically, can, you know, of course, I mean, Marx's entire project is in a sense to map capital, you know, it's very, it's, it's not easy, right, because especially because it, it hides, it's, it's kind of filled with, uh, you know, I don't know, in old-fashioned terms, I suppose, ideological ways of hiding what it's doing, you know, alienation is, is forgetting that, you know, relations between people are not relations between things, you know, we live in a, uh, a way in which we treat other people as obstacles, not as fellow human beings, let's say. You know, all of these kinds of things, right? So we have to, there's an awful lot of, yeah, clearing um, the ground. But also, I mean, the, the other big problem I didn't stress enough, perhaps, was this idea of, of the desire for, of and for the image, you know, which is the, the libidinal element. You know, I mean, we need to, it, it cannot simply be, oh, look at these horrible images and then do something about them. You know, I mean, this isn't going to work. You know, people are saying, no, I'd rather watch this thing or look at these lovely images. They do something else to me. There are ways in which there is a similar attraction to revolutionary politics that are also, you know, it's not just the preserve of capitalist productions and right based and rightist mm. concerns to capture that. There is also the capacity in leftist politics, which then needs to be recaptured, if you like, that is able to produce those yeah. images as well. It's not, it, I, I'm just sort of saying it's the specificity that's necessary, which is the dull, boring bit of it, but the, the yeah, as you yeah, say, yeah. this circulation of, of a business economy, that absolutely vital to the argument. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I think people like Mark Fisher will work on this project all the way through, you know, genuinely, so, yeah. Can we just have one last question yeah. before everyone jumps and have a, has a coffee? Very quick, very quick. Um, you've been yeah. um, thinking about that concept of, of, of enemy photography, I'm, I'm wondering if this is a, if you think of this as mostly an active task for photographers or those taking pictures, or if it could also be something like maybe like a, a, a militant weaponization of how we interpret photographs because I, all I have to do yeah. is go on the rich kids of Instagram account and it's all it's all there all the all the enemy photography yeah is in there um yeah I think it's a really good question I mean I, I only sort of thought about this like in the last three days so um <laughs> the enemy photography thing because I was reading the corner book and I was like oh that's amazing um but I yes I mean I think I think 
both. I mean, I think it, uh, if it if it is a challenge or if it's you know if it's just maybe one way of thinking possibly about what we're doing, you know, whether we are taking the photographs or whether we're reading them, um, I agree. And I, and I think then the question might be probably for me if I'm going to pursue this is, well, that that the set of questions I asked, you know, are these enemy are these photographs of the enemy, you know, in the classical sense of like, uh, you know, enemy images. You know, it, in what sense then might they be constructing hate? You know, of course we can look at those images of the rich kids of Instagram and go like, uh, you know, fuck these people, God, awful, tacky, you know, whatever, right? But this this doesn't seem dialectically enough, really. You know, I mean, this is like a particular image of the consumption, and obviously Martin Parr and others do that too, and and. You know, of course, it generates a particular feeling, but in a sense, that's not exactly it, right? It can't just be that. It can't just be, you know, conspicuous consumption, bad. You know, here are some images. It's it's got to be much more. I mean, you know, obviously there are people like I don't know, even Gersky or someone. You know, like there are ways in which you can image, you know, take images of capital, the the the, the size of capitalism in a certain way, like containers. We can think about those. You know, that whole project of um, imagining. Uh, sort of the movements of global capital capitalism. How do you map that, for example? How do you, you imagine that? Um, so yeah, I think it's got to be maybe more at the level of the image itself. What would it mean to produce, if possible, then like the the enemy photograph in the sense that if Bosch's uh, Garden of Earthly Delights is the enemy painting, you know, and then what would it mean to to have that photograph? You know, would could there be that photograph as such as photography? A medium capable of doing that, whatever that is, and it's not quite clear at the moment to me. But a certain kind of maybe libidinal antagonism, <laughs> something like this. <laughs>